Colonial Twilight, the French-Algerian War. This is a game by GMT that depicts, well, the titular conflict, the War of Independence of Algeria uh, against, against France between the 50s and the 60s. This is a game that in the Co-In uh, series that is a game based on counter-insurgency operations, hence the co in. It is a game. It is a game system that we have seen in several of the titles before: on the Abyss, um, uh, Cuba Libre, Distant Plan. Many of these games, and and usually excellent games. I mean, some more, some less. I've enjoyed all of the coin games, and I really like the system in general. And I also was interested in this topic. It is a topic that I know not so much from reading history books, but mainly from an old movie, The Battle of Algiers, a movie that I like very much. If you haven't seen it, do yourself a favor, watch that movie, because you will learn about, about this conflict, and also it is just spectacular storytelling in, in visual form. So, I like the coin system, uh, I'm interested in the topic, and also this game is very interesting to me because it is a two-player game. It is the first coin game which is not four players only. The previous games are supposed to be four players ideally, but if you don't have four players then you can use the bots. In any case, there are going to be four parties in the game, and you use flowcharts that represent bots that regulate the behavior of the non-playing parties. I always found those bots incredibly cumbersome, so I always made sure when I was playing the games to have exactly four players, which always represents which often presents uh, some logistical challenges. A friend decides not to come over at the last minute or something happens, they can't come at the last minute. And then we are with three and we're supposed to be exactly four. Also, uh, of course, having uh, ideally four players, but again, in my heart, you have to have exactly four players, makes the game a little hard to play uh, solo. Again, you can play one of the four parties and use flowcharts for the other three sides. The times that I played the previous coin games, uh, Solitaire, I did it old school wargamer, that is, playing all sides uh, by myself at the best of my possibilities. Yes, it is a little ambitious, it's a little bit of virtuoso performance, but if you have played um, enough war games in solitaire mode in that playing two sides at the best of your possibilities, then you just add two more sides and you can do that kind of stuff. But the idea that now we have a two-player game, so it's much easier to uh, find the right number of people to play it with, and also a game with, with that number of players, much easier to solo, that is much easier to uh, play all sides uh, by myself, well, that also was very promising to me. So, promising system, promising topic, very promising new number of players. Everything in this game looked very promising. Now, let me give you a closer look at the game. We're gonna see uh, what the game looks like and how it plays and what the objectives of the two sides are. And then we're gonna talk about the, ga the game more in general and we're gonna see if the game kept its promises or not. The game is played on a mounted board, which is obvious to you if you play mainly Euro games, but for a war gamer, eh, not necessarily, but like previous coin games, so this is a mounted board, and a mounted board that looks really good, production values are, as you can expect from games in this series, very high, very good, the map looks great, and also is very playable. What we have here is the play area that represents Algeria. There are two areas on the borders, Morocco and Tunisia respectively. They are non-playable area at the beginning of the game as they're still part of the French Empire. They may gain independence during the game, in which case they become playable areas for the insurgents and a pain in the neck for the French player that will try to stabilize the borders to prevent infiltration. And there is a track here that records the, the health, uh, the health of the, the quality of border security in that area. We have an area where the insurgent will place his uh, or her tokens so that the, the guerrilla, the insurgent pieces, can be active or underground. When they're underground they're not doing much but they're harder to catch so you want to activate them to do stuff. A place where you store your bases, you will want to place bases on the board to gain influence in the region. Speaking of the regions, um, the map is divided in sectors so that are these smaller areas that you see here, pretty much the, the, I would say the, the spatial unit 
of the game. But then these uh, sectors are organized in wilayas, which is pretty much provinces, I would believe, that are indicated by these darker and thicker borders. So these provinces and the city of Constantine are all part of this wilaya. So yes, you have provinces and also you have cities. Terrain, these darker areas represent mountains, uh, which uh, uh, give a great defensive advantage to the insurgents hiding there. And then when we look up close to the areas, we find the same information about regions, sectors, call them whatever you like, that we found in previous coin games. That is, boxes where you place markers uh, to indicate a, or, or you will not place markers to indicate the alliance uh, of the area. If there are no markers that the area is neutral to the government but there can be a marker there that says that the area is in support or in opposition to the government. An area that indicates who is in control, maybe an empty box or there may be a marker there indicating that the French player or the insurgents control that area. A number indicating the population level. The population can change because there are several events that will affect that. And then areas where you can place bases where you can build bases. Generally speaking, early on the uh, French player will have a strong presence in the cities and it can be kind of tough for the for the insurgents to gain to gain a good position in the cities early on. Probably a better strategy, in my experience, is to start building bases all around here in the mountains because, well, the French player can just stay there, stay put and do nothing as bases start popping out guy mushrooms all around. So that will force the French player to stretch uh, his or her forces and give an opportunity to the insurgent to then attack the cities and to start doing start doing bad stuff in the cities as the the cities will be maybe more likely uh, lightly guarded. Up there we have a French track area that keeps uh, keeps track of how things are going in France, the political climate in France, there are effects that will move the marker and the closer it gets to this end of the track the better things are for the insurgent and the opposite is true for the French player that will want to move the marker in the other direction. We have a box here for capabilities that these markers that act as reminders of abilities that the players may acquire during the game through game effects, boxes for casualties and out of play pieces. And then here we have the available area for the French forces. The French forces are divided into French and Algerian and they are further divided into troops that are the dark, the dark cubes and police, which are the light cubes. So we have French troops, French police, Algerian troops, and Algerian police. Now, gameplay uh, works uh, like in previous games you have of the coincidence. You have a deck of event cards. Uh, one will be drawn each turn. Interesting enough, you cannot see ahead. In other games, you could see a card ahead. Not this one. You just draw a card and boom deal with what happens. You get what you get and you're going to again get upset. At the beginning of the game you see the, the, the deck of events with several propaganda cards so they will come out um, at, a, at intervals more or less pandemic style and when a propaganda card comes out so then interrupts the main sequence or the normal sequence of play and you check if somebody has acquired victory, you check you adjust resources, commitment, you check support, reset functions on the board etc etc etc. Now as in previous games, uh, there is going to be a first eligible and a second eligible player and the first eligible gets to see the event and gets first to, get to, to decide whether or not to use that event or the first eligible can choose to do something else and then based on what the first eligible player does, the second eligible can do something else. You may remember that this is a fairly verbose and convoluted part of the game, probably the only one that's a little hard to teach and, and to figure out at the beginning, like if the first player does the event, then the other player can do such and such. If the first player does operations in only one area, then the second player can do such and such. This has been resolved beautifully here. Instead of the sort of like graphs or flow chart that we had in previous games, the possible actions in the game have been organized in this initiative track here, where you have room for the first in eligible and the second eligible. 
But here, see what happens. Basically, the first allergy ball will take an action. Suppose that we decide to execute the event and we hooray execute whichever event we drew. Of course, if it's a double event, you choose which side you want. So you execute. So once you choose what you want to do, you, the first eligible player places their marker there. And then instead of telling if the player does this, then the other player, blah, 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 blah. Now the way this is resolved is the second eligible must place their marker adjacent to that one. So if the first eligible executes an event, then the second can execute operations and execute a special activity or pass. If the first player executed operations only, then uh, the second player can execute a limited operation or pass. If the first player executed, da da da. So, well, you still have to teach these things to the to somebody who is new to the game. But you tell them once, and you tell them just look at the darn thing, and you will see if you do that what is available to the opponent. What a great way of resolving this, of simplifying and making things more intuitive. I definitely, definitely like this. But now let's take a closer look at the actions that are available to the players. Each player controls a set of pivotal event cards that can be played during the game. They're very powerful events and heck, that's why they call them pivotal, not just because they like the sound of the word. Some of these events uh, have uh, the play of other events as their condition. For example, you may play mobilization, but then uh, to play Morocco and Tunisia Independent, which is a card for the insurgents, that mobilization needs to to have been played and other cards uh, work like that in a chain. These cards are one time used with the exception of coup d'etat which is a little complicated I'm not gonna go over it you can just pause the video and read the text if you so wish but these are important events that give structure give a certain general architecture to the to the game. The game is not going to be just we go through cards you know 60 times and do stuff although it would be good already. Uh, on top of that, you have those sort of like multiple act tragedy um, or, or you know passion play punctuated by the pivotal event. Now the players again using the initial track that I showed you will execute operations and or special activities, and the two sides have different uh, ranges of possible operations. You have player rates, very well done player rates, like in previous coin games, telling you what the two sides can do. And there is no way of getting your sense of how the game works, but to go through through these events, a sort of laundry list style. Yes, it will feel a little abstract and a little disconnected. But I, I haven't found any other way of describing a coin game but to show what the actions are. But they come together doing gameplay. Trust me about this one. They will feel very cohesive and very logically connected once you're actually implementing these activities on the board. Train, basic operations. Oh, wait, let's have a look at the government actions. Train, because you need cubes and it allows you to place four Algerian cubes. Also, you can remove terror. Terror, you may remember from previous games, and makes it harder to change the political status of an area. And also pacify, that is, improve the opinion of the population towards the government by one level. Also, you can improve your border zone track. Garrison, you move police and you activate guerrilla. So you move up to six police cubes between locations and then you activate a guerrilla for each police cube there. Activating again, in this case, simply means to turn from underground to active, which makes it easier to target it later. Sweep. You, this is very similar, but it's based on troops instead of police. And of course, e actions have a cost in terms of resources. The national player, that is the French player, the government has a lot of resources, but also a lot of expenses. The other player has fewer resources, but uh, the actions are often cheaper. With the sweep action, the government can move troops, not police, into adjacent spaces and then activate guerrilla. Assault, when things get bloody, any set of space, remove an anti guerrilla or base for each troops cube. However, only one for every two in mountains. As you can see, it's harder to catch, to catch people in mountains. You need twice as many troops 
in cities or in a border sector, the police can be used to count as troops. There are a couple of other things, but I don't want to read everything. These are special activities that can be associated with the operations if you're taking the option and you're able to, to execute an operation plus a special activity. By deploy, you can move French pieces among available, available that is the available box and, and spaces, and that's how you get French pieces on the board. And how many pieces are in available also will affect one of the stats, which is commitment, is one of the victory conditions for the players. By moving place pieces in and out of available of the available box, you will affect that. Well, again, this is very important. Also, this is the action you take to resettle people, that is to alter the population value of areas on the board. Troop lift, you redistribute French troops and neutralize, you destroy exposed, you destroy exposed insurgents, remove a total of two active guerrillas or bases from among the selected spaces. Every time that you eliminate enemy pieces, you need to eliminate their combat pieces first, in this case, um, the active insurgents, and then you can eliminate the bases. And of course, bases are very important because they're important for victory conditions for the insurgents. They're important as recruitment points. But again, pretty much the government player needs to first needs to first find them, that is, activate them, and then eliminate them. And they all need to be eliminated before a base can be attacked. Now, as for the insurgents, operations for the insurgents, we have the rally, very important, because you get new guerrillas, or you replace two guerrillas with a base. Or, if you have a base, instead of placing a guerrilla, Instead, you may place guerrillas up to population plus bases. So instead of one, you get a number of guerrillas that is equal to the population of the area plus the number of bases you have there. So much better. Or you can choose to send all of your combatants underground in case they're activated. Also, in one selected space, you can remove a terror, that is, you can affect the political uh, situation and agitate it, is worsen the perception of the local population, the population has of the government. Also, you can influence the French track, which is the one that we mentioned earlier. You can move the marker on that track. March, which is how you move pieces on the board. Attack, very, very dangerous. You need to roll a d6 and roll equal to or lower than the number of guerrillas that you have. So the more combatants you have, the more likely it is that you'll be able to roll equal or lower. You can, if you are successful, you will move up to two pieces, enemy pieces to casualties, but you also remove an equal number of, of your own combatants. When they attack head first, when they attack at first, the, the government, it's tough, it's bloody, and the attrition can be really bad. Uh, luckily enough, there is an alternative, which is the ambush, which will give less, uh, will inflict a smaller damage, fewer casualties, but also does not inflict damage on the on the insurgents. And you can read the text for, for details. Terror, which is again a way of affecting the level of support. In each selected space, you activate an insurgent unit, and then you add the terror market and you terror marker, and you set the space to neutral. After you're done with these things that consume resources, you also need to gain resources. So why don't you just extort them from the local population? You simply reveal your units that you activate them and then add resources. Very easy way for the insurgents to collect resources, but potentially dangerous if there are uh, sweeps, sweeps and attacks are in the air, if the government is planning then to, to storm the areas where you just rebuild your units and destroy your units. Subvert, again, you um, you inf you uh, change the political situation, but this time in a way that affects the the forces of the insurgents, this one targets only the Algerian cubes, but you can remove them or replace them, replace a police with an underground guerrilla. This can be very important in cities where there will be a lot of police, it's hard for the insurgent to infiltrate, but then if you're able to actually convince some of the police forces to become an insurgent, then good for them. Ambush, as I said, is the, uh, is the, sa the smaller lower intensity but safer way for the insurgent to attack 
to attack enemy forces. And these are the actions, these are the main actions that the players will take during the main rounds, main, main, main rounds, not during the propaganda rounds. So the insurgents will go around, try to worsen the political situation for the French, both in Algeria and in France. They will try to create groups of insurgents, possibly in the mountains early on, to to create bases, to improve their recruitment. From time to time, they'll put together some large group to attack enemy groups. Meanwhile, the French, the government player, will be forced to come out of the city to get people from France um, and to try to hunt down the insurgents in the mountains, remove their bases, and try to pacify the situation as much as possible, that is to reduce the the level of support uh, for the insurgents that the insurgents are building. You continue like this until one of the players has met the victory conditions during a propaganda round and that is based on points that are scored for the insurgents uh, based on the sum of opposition that they are able to gather plus bases that they have on the board and for the French player, the points that they score are based on a sum of support that they are able to collect and commitment. Commitment that it is affected. It's just is a, it's a numerical value that is affected by various factors. But this is how you play Colonial Twilight. Yes, this game keeps its promises and and more than that. I'm very pleased with this game. It's probably my favorite game in the co in series. Um, because, well, all the things that I mentioned in the introduction that I thought I was hoped to find, I was hoped that would pay off, all true. The topic feels very, very historical. The game feels very historical, uh, very thematic, a lot of chrome, thanks to the cards and to the action. So that is great. For somebody who is interested in the topic, there is this way of learning about it. We have all of the good things that we liked about the coin system in a package which is much more approachable because, as I said, it's easier to find the right number of players to play too. If you can't find that one other person, then you can solo it much more easily. But it's not just about a matter of opportunity. It's not just that you get to play more often. Gameplay itself is more accessible without losing its quality, without losing its, its um, the elements of this system that you liked in previous games. Why is it more accessible? Because coin games are all about non-symmetrical gameplay. Each entity, each party, each side has different ranges of actions that it can perform. That means that in the traditional coin games, where you had four entities, not only did you need to learn about what you could do, but to be able to play competently, you also needed to have a very clear idea of what everybody else could do. Otherwise, you were just at the mercy of counteractions that they could take that you did not expect. So it just got a while before people learned about the system and then about their party and then about everybody else. Here, you have a lot less homework to do while you still have all the flavor and all the crumb that comes from non-symmetrical gameplay from uh, the government and the insurgents playing completely different ways, very different challenges, great replay value if you just switch sides. Uh, with again the uh, the French uh, government uh, together you know with the Algerian police and army um, having the numer having the numerical advantage or say you know the, the strength advantage the economic advantage but then with the insurgents being sneaky retreating in the mountains uh, setting up bases and forcing and forcing uh, the French and Algerian forces to uh, to respond to that to prevent them from expanding too much from creating uh, too strong of a net. The game really exemplifies one of the tenets in counterinsurgency and one of the one of the elements of uh, um, the differentiates insurgency and counterinsurgency from traditional warfare. The idea is that traditional armies uh, lose if they don't win battles, but insurgencies win simply if they don't lose. Insurgencies have times on their side. All they need to do is to stay alive, to stay around. It is the army, the traditional army, that is forced to go after them while the insurgents uh, stabilize their uh, control over the territory, they recruit new people, etc. etc. The longer the conflict goes, uh, the better things are for the insurgents. 
And so you have precisely this in the in the in the insurgents that will be trying to avoid conflict and to build other things. Waiting, however, is not just a passive defense. Uh, waiting for an opportunity when the government size is stretched, and then you're going to puncture uh, their centers, their neurologic centers. Uh, it's not a game with clear fronts, it's not a war game in that sense, it's all over the map and that really fits the theme and also it presents interesting, of course, decisions for the players as you're trying to concentrate your force in a certain area and all of a sudden you realize, holy whatever, I didn't realize what was going on in that other side that they had built that horrible net of bases, now I'm gonna switch I'm going to transfer forces, I'm going to call reinforcement from France, which will cause all sorts of problems, and I'm going to drop them there. And meanwhile, they do something else. The fact that the insurgents can pop out anywhere and everywhere, uh, like mushrooms, is, of course, very thematic. Um, also, the game depicts uh, against other elements of counterinsurgency really exemplifies the difference between traditional warfare and insurgencies and counterinsurgencies. That is, a traditional army meets a traditional army, defeats that traditional army, and now the winning army is better, is in a better position. Um, as opposed to an army fights against a group of insurgents, they win the battle, and now they're not better off. They're probably in a worse strategic situation because now the local population is annoyed. Uh, you cause violence, the people don't did not enjoy. The insurgents get to recruit more people. They get more power over the population. The, the opposition is stronger, and so on and so forth. Again, that's the game exemplifies that very well. As the government, you have enormous power capability, I would say a, a vastly larger attack capability than the insurgents, but they have sort of like deal with the population that is better than the one that you have. Uh, so there, there are all these elements of counterinsurgency, that historical counterinsurgency, theory of counterinsurgency, that you find depicted in the game, and that's a perfect game to exemplify these, these mechanics and these dynamics. While, as I said, at the same time, all of these elements you find in a game that is perfectly playable gameplay-wise, it's very it's, it's very fun to play, and also much easier to get into the previous coin games, and uh, much easier, again, to find the right number of players. This, of all the coin games, this is a game that I believe uh, the owners will bring to the table much more often than with the other games. Again, not just because it's easier to get it set up, but because it is at least as fun as the previous games with the advantages of being more accessible. And again, it's not just uh, accessibility. Gameplay itself is of very high quality. What I like here is that in a sense it feels more like a war game than the previous uh, coin games while at the same time retaining all of those uh, specific peculiar counterinsurgency elements. It feels tight, it feels more focused with the fact that there are only these two parties, the map is not huge, there are certain areas that may not come into play every game. So it's really, it's a tighter experience, while again, at the same time, keeping the possibility of several shifting foci of, of action during the game. It strikes a really nice balance, again, between uh, narrow focus and chaos, and you need the latter for the game to be about counterinsurgency, and it is desirable to have the former to have a game, a game experience that is tight, that is compelling, that keeps you uh, interested in what's happening, you don't get distracted, you don't get too confused, you don't get like, ah, oh, too many things to keep track on. There's just a little too much for you uh, to do, meaning there are just too many things that you want to do and you're just a couple of resources short, so you always have those dilemmas on how to budget your resources, which is the best thing that can happen in games. So that is precisely what you want in a game. Decisions that are not trivial at all, that are challenging and fun to take and that have real stakes and real consequences within the game and also the fact that they'll strain your resources so you're always slightly off balance and so you always have reasons again, to pay attention to commit to the design. 
Colonial Twilight. To me, possibly the best game in the coin system and definitely the game that will get most most time on the table the, because I it's certainly going to be the game that I'm going to use to introduce new players to the system. There are the games that were good for this before, but I think none, none at all like, like, like this one. It's the perfect intro to the coin system while at the same time being an excellent game even for the most seasoned world gamers even for the most seasoned players of this year's is an excellent game in its own right while also being a great gateway game and we talk get a word game to the coin system again when we talk about gateway game very often we say yeah there are some minor flaws it's a little too light and shallow but it has that intro value this is a game that has that intro value without any of the shortcomings that we often associate with gateway games. It is a great intro to the system and an absolutely great game in its own. So highly recommended. Twilight, a Colonial Twilight by GMT Games.